Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and our study of the book of Daniel. As an introduction to our study of Daniel chapter 5, we are going to focus on the history of Babylon. Babylon before Daniel, Babylon at the time of Daniel, Babylon since Daniel, and Babylon in the future. This study is imperative for understanding Daniel, but also important for our study of the entire Bible, and especially Bible prophecy. We now join our study of the history of Babylon in progress. That is not a theology textbook. That's a history book. Amen. It is, there's theology in there. But it is from Genesis to Revelation, history. Some of it's already over with. Some of it is yet to take place. But it's all history. That's what prophecy is, is history before it happens. Now, um, this picture is an artist's rendering of Babylon. And... Um, as you listen to what I'm about to read from Clarence Larkin's book of Daniel commentary, listen to this description of the city called Babylon. This is just amazing. The city was built in an exact square of 15 miles on a side or 60 miles around. It was surrounded by a brick wall 87 feet thick. That's 60 mile long building that's 87 feet thick. Now, I can see the engineer over here. He's <laughs> and it goes, he continues, which according to Herodotus was, get this, picture in your mind, 350 feet high. 350 feet high, 87 feet thick. Now you have no wonder at all why Babylon was so hard to ever defeat. <laughs> Now this is what he says, on the walls were 250 towers, all spread out, and the top of the wall was wide enough to permit six chariots to drive abreast. This was basically a six-lane highway, 350 feet in the air, 60 miles around, just like we have 270, yeah. Yeah. only all we did was pave the dirt. <laughs> We put pavement on top of the dirt. He built this massive 350 foot wall, 87 feet. He continues and uh, says that there was a vast ditch or a moat that surrounded the city outside that wall, kept filled with water from the river Euphrates and crossed by draw bridges in front of the gates. Inside the wall and not far from it was another wall. <laughs> not much inferior, but narrower, extending around the city. Now, try to picture this. 25 magnificent avenues, 150 feet wide, ran across the city north and south, and the same number ran across them at right angles from east to west, making 676 squares. Now, again, he, goes, he says that there was a wide avenue that ran across uh, the city inside the walls, and close to them, into which the cross avenues emptied. So it's like a, just a laid out a system. At the end of these cross avenues, magnificently burnished two-leaf gates of brass were built in the city walls that shone as they were open or closed in the rising or setting of the sun like leaves of flame, meaning it looked like fire coming off these gates because they shine like brass. Now this blew my mind. This is technology that I didn't know that existed back then. He said, at the Central Avenue, there was a magnificent bridge that spanned the Euphrates River. At each end of the bridge was a palace. These palaces were connected by a subterranean passageway, or tube, underneath the river. So they would actually travel underneath the river, and while they were traveling... At different points, they had these sumptuous banquet rooms constructed entirely of brass. So, that's the magnificence of Babylon, and this understanding of Babylon is an important backdrop to the entire Bible. From We'll see from Genesis all the way to the end. Um, Babylon, understanding what you're reading, when you're reading about Babylon. And the history of Babylon began shortly after the flood. And it will end during uh, the Great Tribulation, at the uh, return of Jesus Christ, when God judges the nations. And believe it or not, Babylon begins with Ham. Uh, Genesis 10, if you want to turn there, 
<clears throat> we're going to look at a few verses. Genesis 10.6 says, And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan. Now, uh, Cush, we'll see, is the father of Nimrod. Now, in verses, uh, did I get that right? 8 and 9, uh, we see that Nimrod, you could call him the son of Cush, the son of Ham. And verses 8 and 9, And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So there's Ham, Cush, and Nimrod. And then in verse 10, it says, In the beginning of his kingdom, referring to Nimrod, was Babel. And Erech and Akkad and Kalne, look at this, in the land of Shinar. Now, when you read the Bible, you'll see references to Shinar, and if you don't get this, you won't realize you're reading about Babylon. So Babel is in the land of Shinar. Now let's have a little flashback here. You remember the first study we did in Daniel, it said in verse 1 that uh, came Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And in verse 2 it describes the vessels of the house of God which he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried into the land of Shinar. So there you have it. Babel is Babylon. It's in the land of Shinar. So every time you read your Bible and you see those words, they are interchangeable. Now, this Babel that we read about in Genesis 10 casts a long shadow. The Tower of Babel has a shadow cast through history that will take us right down to the end of the Great Tribulation period. In, on some of the money used by the European Union, they depict the Tower of Babel being rebuilt. And they portray the European Union as rebuilding Babel. The United Nations has done the same thing. That's basically a slap in God's face because He stopped the building of the Tower of Babel and they're basically saying, uh -uh, we're going to pick up where they left off. How do we get from the Tower of Babel to Nebuchadnezzar? Babel became known as Babylonia. So there's another term. You want to, it's kind of obvious, but you may not uh, put the two together. Babel, Babylon, Babylonia, Shinar, all the same. And um, Babylonia fell under Assyrian control, but Assyria allowed the governor of Babylon to remain in control. And that was just something that the um, ancient conquerors would do a lot. And Nebuchadnezzar actually did that uh, with the Jews until finally he was fed up with Zedekiah, I think it is, and poked his eyes out and brought him back, and that was the end of that. But um, Now, just as a footnote, Assyria was founded by Asher, who was one of Shem's descendants. So you have the Shem, Shemites in Assyria and the Hamites under Nimrod in Babylon. The Shemites had taken control of Babylon. Then a man who was governor uh, at this time uh, in the uh, mid-6th century B.C., Nabopolassar, or Na Nabopolassar. He was assisted by um, Zyazerxes, uh, Zyazeres, sorry, Zyazeres the Mede. Now, of course, we know later in chapter 5, we're going to read next week, the Medes will come back into play, not as a friend to Babylon. But at this point, uh, the Mede helped Nabopolassar throw off the Assyrians, and so um, Babylon became independent again of Assyria. And this Nabopolassar uh, just happened to be Nebuchadnezzar's daddy. And that's how we get from Babel to where we are in Daniel 5. Now this is very interesting. I give you the reference here for Josephus and his book on the, the his, his history. Book 10 chapter 11 and um, Section 1, he describes this event. But Nebuchadnezzar was sent as a youth. He was a young man. But Nebopolassar had become um, sick and frail and couldn't go out and fight. So, and he didn't trust 
his armies to just anybody, and so he decided he'd send his young man, Nebuchadnezzar, down to fight the governor of Egypt, Mizraim, who had rebelled. Well, while Nebuchadnezzar, we'll just call him Nebi for short, he was conquering Egypt, and his father died. So he rushed back um, to uh, Babylon to assume the throne. So that's how all that happened. But here's something to, important that uh, adds to your understanding of, of the situation we've been reading about in Daniel. The kingdom, when his dad died, could have been taken over by anybody. He was hundreds of miles away in Egypt fighting a war. And it took him a few weeks to take care of business and then rush back. It, the kingdom was preserved for him from the time of his father's death until his arrival by the leader of the Chaldeans. And now you understand why these guys who kind of seem like, for lack of a better term, boobs, <laughs> these Chaldeans never could do anything for him. It seemed like they were always useless to him, yet he was pretty faithful to them. Although there were a couple times he was like, he, <laughs> I'm done with you. <laughs> what did he say? Chop him in pieces and turn their houses into dunghills. <laughs> that was... A, but uh, the reason why, though, he was so seemingly uh, faithful to these guys was because they had helped make sure that he took over the kingdom when his dad died. Now, this political kingdom we've been reading about, Babylon, as we know, the Chaldeans and all these were very influential, and it was an occultic religious union with the political kingdom. But it kind of metamorphosized into just... Mystery Babylon. Um, political Babylon, as we'll see in chapter 5, falls to Medo-Persia, who, remember the image, was the arms of silver? But it doesn't die. Keep that in mind. They don't destroy Babylon. They take it over and usurp it into the Medo-Persian Empire. Religious Babylon then continues to live on, and it has merged into the mystery religions. So now if you want to know what has happened to Babylon, where is Babylon through history, you look for it in the mystery religions. And you identify the mystery religions in two ways. Number one is their practices, and number two is their locations. Or the location, I should say. Now, we can go back and see that Israel... Uh, it's kind of hard for us to understand how it is Israel continues to fall into apostasy, but you have to understand that Israel's ancient apostasy, as well as their modern apostasy, caught up in the Talmud and the Kabbalah and all these occultic uh, aberrations to their true religion. Most Jews aren't true Jews. Most Jews do not aren't Torah Jews. Very small number of truly Orthodox Jews, and even they really are still Talmudic Jews. They still allow that tradition to blind them to the truth of God's Word. Mm -hmm. But um, you can trace it back to the infection of this mystery Babylon religion. In Ezekiel 23, you want to turn there. Ezekiel chapter 23. And we'll see that mystery Babylon infected Israel. And it explains what we've seen through the centuries with Israel and their apostasy. In Ezekiel chapter 23 and verse 17. Read verse uh, uh, 17 of Ezekiel 23 with me. And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they deviled her with their whoredom, and she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. She so noticed that how the Babylonians infected defiled, that reference to her is a reference to Israel. So we're going to identify Babylon in Israel, and then we'll see Babylon today by identifying, first of all, the practices, what we could call Mystery Babylon Fundamentals. Mike is uh, teaching uh, you know, on Tuesdays, the Fundamentals downtown, and he's going to have his book. He's already got it out, but he's going to be revising, editing, expanding, all that. That's the fundamentals of Christianity. But most religions have fundamentals, and Mystery Babylon is no different. And the first one we're going to look at is, Mystery Babylon established those Chaldeans, 
They were a father priest class. And uh, any human priesthood other than the Aaronic priesthood is Mystery Babylon. Um, now, there was a Melchizedek priesthood before Aaron's priesthood. There'll be a priesthood in the millennium. But we're talking about in this, uh, in the Old Testament era, and now there's actually no priesthood because the veil was torn when Christ paid the full price for sin. But any uh, attempt to have a priesthood would have to be of the line of Aaron, or it, it's not legitimate. This is really the origination of Roman Catholicism. Uh, right, people say Roman Catholicism isn't in the Bible. Well, yes it is. <laughs> but it's just not the... Uh, it's the false religion in the Bible. It's, and here is the first uh, uh, type of a Roman Catholic priest, or you could say any of the other priesthoods that exist. The Mormons have a priesthood, by the way. Um, then the Orthodox Church has their priesthood, and the Buddhists have their priesthood. Judges 18, chapter 18 and verse 19... There? Okay, read verses, uh, just verse 19 with me. And they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth, and go with us, and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man, or that thou be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel? Here's this guy, he's actually a priest in a home of a family and the uh, tribe of I believe it's Dan it, yeah, and the tribe of Dan uh, leaders of the tribe of Dan see him there and they say come on you're coming with us you'll be a father and a priest to us so there you have a priest being called father for the first time now referring to a priest as father is Babylonian blasphemy uh, it doesn't matter you know, who, what religion you want to talk about. Referring to a priest as father, you have one spiritual father. And referring to, that's why Jesus in Matthew 23, 9 said, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. And of course he's speaking in spiritual terms. He's not saying you can't talk about your biological dad and call him father, but in the spirit... You, you have one father. And you know, Paul refers to being as a father to Timothy, and people try to claim that legitimizes this practice, but Paul is speaking of how he actually took Timothy under his wing and fathered him because Timothy's father wasn't a believer. He's not talking about spiritually his father. The identifying thing about this is that there's a term in the Bible called Nicolaitanism, or the Nicolaitans. Nico means conquer, and laity means the people. Conquer the people. And it says in Revelation 2.15 that God hates it. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. And let, let me tell you, by the way, that God hates things. Do you know that? Amen. There's this false God out there being preached that doesn't hate anything. My God hates things. He hates wickedness. He hates sin. He hates priest classes conquering the laity. So you have the father-priest class, which identifies the mystery Babylon religion, and you also have this thing called groves and images. Mm -hmm. Idols you find in groves is a mark of Babylon, and God orders them destroyed. Exodus 23, 17, He commanded, but ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. But instead of destroying them, Israel built their own and imitated Babylon. Second Chronicles 24, 18. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. Mm -hmm. And wrath came upon them, upon Judah and Jerusalem, for this their trespass. And that leads us to the third fundamental, the Queen of Heaven. The worship of an image of the Queen of Heaven is the mark of Mystery Babylon. That started with Semiramis and Nimrod and was carried through the Mystery Babylon religions and spread throughout and including in Israel. And Jeremiah 44, 25, 
Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hand, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. You go to any Roman Catholic church you will find the Queen of Heaven and you will see a priest that they call Father burning incense to her and worshiping her and offering drink offerings to her. They even take the Mass and I've seen, I don't know that every church does this, but I've seen the church down Southern Ohio. They take and they lift it up before Mary before they offer it to everybody. And they called the Queen of Heaven by the Roman Catholic Church and she's worshipped the same way that they worship the Queen of Heaven in Babylon mystery religion. I have a video for anybody who wants to borrow it, or you can watch it online for free. It's called Messages from Heaven. It's about 90 minutes, and it shows Mary worship is taking the world by storm. It's even involving those who are involved into the UFO thing. They think she's an alien. Then you have Fatima, Our Lady of Fatima. That's in, that's in an Islamic country and Muslims are taking part in Mary worship now and so you have the and then Buddhists and Hindus just add her to their gods their pantheon of gods so you in the new age movement they're all into this new age and you see liberals there on the video they show liberal Protestants who are taking a part in Mary worship you go to the uh, emergent churches and they are taking part in Mary worship so this thing's taken the world by storm and by the way, just before, we'll say this and move on, but the Immaculate Conception, yes. that people always say that's Jesus being conceived of a virgin. Um, his conception being of a virgin, it's not. The Immaculate Conception is that Mary was supposedly conceived without original sin. So you'll hear Catholics even don't even understand what they believe because they'll even get confused on that. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is that Mary was born without original sin. So you have those three, Father, Priest, Class, Groves and Images, Queen of Heaven, and the final is the church-state setup. That's the fourth fundamental of Mystery Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's empire was a church-state setup. His leaders, his hand-picked leaders were all the Chaldeans and religious leaders. And um, there is only one global religion in our day that observes these four criteria. <laughs> and sits in the geographical location for Mystery Babylon. For that, we want to turn to Revelation 17. If you want to turn there, Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17 verse 4 and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. The Roman Catholic Church that's their official colors. I mean official. I don't mean you just see it a lot. I mean that's their official colors. Yeah. And a cup, the chalice, in her hand represents that Eucharist. Now, listen, everything God does, Satan counterfeits. There is the bread and the cup to be done in remembrance of Jesus Christ. <laughs> But this is a cup of abominations. Cannibalism, claiming to eat the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. That's what they say. That's, that's what they claim. And the priest, father of priest, claims to have the power to speak some hocus pocus and cause it to be transformed. And then when you eat it, you're eating flesh and blood. Now I know this sounds crude, but I'm just, it, I, I don't like living in a fairy tale world, folks. That means later on they flush Jesus. That's how ridiculous that doctrine is. If you ate him, then later on you flush him down the toilet. So it's a ridiculous blasphemy. But again, we, it identifies who this mystery Babylon is. And it says in verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, 
the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Folks, you study Roman Catholic history, and I recommend A Woman Rides the Beast by Dave Hunt and Fox's Book of Martyrs and The Pilgrim Church by E.H. Broadbent. Those three books will detail for you the tens of millions of born-again Christians who were slaughtered by the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Burned at the stake, had their tongues ripped out, their eyes poked out, ripped open, raped, killed in numerous ways. Yeah, lit their bodies on stakes. All because people like you, people like you, wouldn't accept the Pope and that Eucharist. They would hold the wafer up to people's face and say, confess that this is the real body of Jesus Christ. And they said, I will not. And they would die for it. Read those books. And you'll see. And that's why it says, I wandered with great admiration. It's, it, don't misunderstand what he's saying. This means he was blown away by this. How could this one, this mystery Babylon, that puts on all this religious show, be so deadly for Christians? And have killed the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And it just blew John's mind, to put it in my terms. <laughs> Look at verse 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. And verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Bingo. Bingo. The Roman Catholic Church is the Vatican State. The Roman Vatican State is located on Vatican Hill in Rome. And Rome is the city on seven hills. Now, like so many things in prophecy, it's set up but not complete. Yes, Vatican Hill is where it's at. Give it time. When the anti well, we'll be in heaven. But while we're in heaven and the beast is signing that seven-year treaty, he's going to bring the world together by giving everybody a little bit of what they want. The Dome of the Rock will not be destroyed. You hear people all the time saying that Dome of the Rock has to be destroyed. No, it doesn't. It is located, I believe Zola Levitt was right, it is located in the outer court and Revelation 11 says, don't measure the outer court, it's been given over to the Gentiles. The Dome of the Rock can stay there and they will still build the temple and they will give Rome the other six hills. And that is when you know you've nailed it. <laughs> and so the Roman Catholic Church is Vatican State, Vatican State is Mystery Babylon. But you learn, and then you look at, look at what is going on in the church today, and so much of this mystery Babylon has crept in. Be sure to visit our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com, where you can find a wealth of MP3 audio message downloads, along with additional videos, articles, and links. This message is brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. I am Greg Miller. Thank you for listening.